Chapter 8 from The Wonderful Flight to the Mushroom Planet. Mr. Bass does some tinkering. Down in the cellar, Mr. Bass padded off into a corner. Presently, the place was flooded with a soft, very clear light, which revealed the most astonishing array of contraptions the boys had ever seen. Great jumping cadiddlefish, shouted Chuck. You must invent all sorts of miraculous things, Mr. Bass. Oh, yes, I suppose I do, replied Mr. Bass modestly. But you see, most of my inventions aren't any good for production on a large scale, because I'm like one of those cooks who put in a little of this and a little of that and get the most delicious concoctions you ever tasted. But then they can't tell anyone afterward just exactly how they did it. Now there, said Mr. Bass, is your rocket motor. Here, and he turned to his long littered workbench where lay two shining cylinders are the fuel containers for your journey. The fuel in them is another invention of mine, but I assure you that this fuel is incredibly powerful. It's like a shade of paint. I don't imagine for the life of me that I could get just this mixture again. Will it work? queried Chuck a bit uncertainly. Oh, of course it'll work, laughed Mr. Bass, hustling over to the spaceship with some long lengths of pipe and some wires and the shining cylinders. Then he went over to the rocket motor and with the help of the boys, got it down off of its shelf. Now I'll just put in this motor and hook up the fuel tanks. Then we'll be ready to put the sealer on your ship and store in the oxygen supply. Can't have you blacking out on the journey now, can we? No, sir, murmured David as he watched with amazement how quickly and firmly little Mr. Bass set to work. To look at that small, frail man, you would never have imagined him capable even of tightening a bolt or of being able to lift anything heavier than a glass of water. But in the wink of an eye, he had the rocket motor in and the cylinders installed in the rear of the spaceship and connected to the motor by a lot of intricate looking wiring. Gee, cried Chuck in astonished admiration. I guess you're kind of a genius, aren't you, Mr. Bass? Like Leonardo da Vinci. Our teacher told us all about him. He could paint pictures and think up inventions and make airships and everything just like you. Oh my, protested Mr. Bass. I think that's going a long way, Chuck, to put me in the same class with such a great man. But I do hit on some rather interesting ideas now and then. Well, let's see now. Mr. Bass scratched his head and then went over to a large wooden vat. Here are some brushes. We can all do this. Just slosh this stuff over the outside of the ship, over every single inch of it now, and it'll be sealed up tight as a drum. It dries hard like glass. Here we go. So all three of them, each with his big brush, painted the spaceship with the fluid resonoid silicon with other ingredients, David read on the label, from one end to the other, and right over the window as Mr. Bass directed. And you could still see through it, just as though the marvelous fluid were not there. Then Mr. Bass seemed to feel that the job was not yet finished, for he got inside the spaceship and thoroughly painted the inner surface as well. That'll do it, he cried, vastly pleased at the way the mixture had dried. And what is most important, boys, is that now you will be absolutely protected from the lethal rays of the sun, which, unhindered by any atmosphere, could have penetrated the ship's walls and done you unimaginable harm. Amazing. If only I had put down what I did to get this substance. But all I have left of that experiment are a few scrabbly notes. Ah, oh, well, it's no matter. Let's get on to something else. Now he pointed out to them an object somewhat like a big coffee urn with a spigot at the side. This is your oxygen supply, he said. Help me, boys, will you? This goes inside the ship, and I have arranged, by means of a mechanism on the spigot, that you will be supplied with just the minimum of oxygen necessary to keep you comfortable between the atmosphere of Earth and that of Basidium. Now, here we go, heave up. All three together, the boys and Mr. Bass heaved and shoved and got the strange looking urn inside the ship and stored away in the rear. Turn the little handle of the spigot just before you take off, instructed Mr. Bass. But don't forget to turn it back when you land on Basidium. You must not waste an ounce of your oxygen. And now, 
the little man went on, hopping down from the spaceship and turning to face the boys as they came after him. Another matter. And he held up that long first finger of his. It is absolutely necessary that you leave immediately on the dot of 12 midnight. Mr. Bass fixed them with his huge, solemn, pale brown eyes. And for some reason, the boys felt shivers go up and down their backs. Yes, Mr. Bass, immediately, said David. Yes, sir, said Chuck, and then couldn't help adding, but why? I will tell you, answered Mr. Bass. And he went over to his bench and picked up some papers all covered, the boys could see, with long rows of figures, rows and rows of them. Mr. Bass must have been busy for days working out awfully hard arithmetic problems, short division and long division and subtraction and multiplication and everything you could think of. You see, he said, as Basidium is 50,000 miles out in space, and as you will have to travel at an average speed of 25,000 miles an hour, that means it will take you two hours to get there. Am I right? The boys gasped and trembled and then nodded without answering. Now I have calculated precisely the position of Basidium in relation to the earth at two in the morning, two hours after midnight, that is. Therefore, if you do not leave at midnight exactly, went on Mr. Bass with a terrible look, it is dangerously possible that you will not hit Basidium at all. And if you do not leave Basidium at exactly four tomorrow morning, according to our time, you will not contact the earth at this spot. Instead, you may land on the barren wastes of Tibetan Plateau, from which no human beings could ever rescue you. Or it might be you would miss the Earth entirely and shoot on far into the uncharted regions of outer space, where you would be lost forever. Have I made myself clear? The uncharted regions of outer space? David shuddered and thought how the barren wastes of the Tibetan Plateau sounded almost cozy and comfortable by comparison. All clear, Mr. Bass, he replied weakly, but Chuck only blinked and was silent. Good, said Mr. Bass, in a brisk, business-like tone, as though he had no more than settled that they might land at Fisherman's Wharf instead of the corner drugstore. I shall give you this paper, David, to be kept by you at all times. It has the position of the controls of the spaceship. Add what figures to set them on leaving Earth, and then on leaving Basidium. Several thousand miles out from Basidium, the ship has to turn around in space in order to land tail down on Basidium. All ready to take off again, you see. Also, the rocket motor must be shut off so the ship can go into freefall, that is, be drawn by gravity only, toward Basidium. The same turn in space and the shutting off the motor must take place when you're approaching Earth on your return journey. But this you need not worry about. I have installed a surprisingly simple mechanism in the rocket motor, which takes care of these matters. David folded the paper carefully and put it in his wallet. Then he put his wallet in his pocket and buttoned over the flap. Now the next thing is, went on Mr. Bass, who has a watch? Wordlessly, Chuck held out his wrist, around which was strapped the fine sturdy watch with luminous hands and figures that Captain Tom had given him for Christmas. Oh, capital, exclaimed Mr. Bass, simply capital and luminous hands into the bargain couldn't be better. I trust you will use that watch, boys, to the very best advantage, because time for you will be a matter of life and death. This is all you have to remember. Make your contacts on the hour. No matter what else happens, be on time. David was silent for a moment, and then the question that had been hovering vaguely but troublesomely in the back of his head got itself into words. Mr. Bass, he began, there's something I just can't understand. However are we to talk to the mushroom people? What if we can't talk to them? How are we to find out what's the matter, what we can do to help them? Mr. Bass smiled at David, an excellent question, my boy, but I ask you to believe me. Everything will be all right. You and the mushroom people will understand one another perfectly. Now he held out a hand to each of the boys and they knew that their visit with Mr. Bass had come to an end. Mr. Bass, burst out Chuck, why can't you come with us? You just can't stay behind. You're so wise and know everything we ought to do. You've got to come. But Mr. Bass regretfully shook his head. Oh no, Chuck, that is impossible, he said. 
If I went with you, all would be in vain, for I am an adult. Don't you remember? I said that only children could do this thing. A grown-up would spoil it. And besides, I feel that there is something else in store for me. Yes. And he looked away for a second with a rather an odd expression. I have a feeling that I must prepare for a very important event in my life here on Earth. And that means there is a great deal to be done. Dear me, yes, a great deal. Now one last thing, finished Mr. Bass. You must on no account forget the candy jar of Basidium air. Simply leave it uncovered while you do your work on Basidium. Then, at the end of two hours, screw the lid tightly back on and bring it to me. I am very anxious to analyze that air so that I can find out the mystery of its greenness. And now, goodbye, boys. The very best of fortune go with you. As the boys drew their spaceship out of the cellar into the daylight, the sunlight flashed and glistened once more on its beautiful silvery sides. How could it be possible, David asked himself, that the very night it would carry Chuck and him 50,000 miles into the cold and trackless dark? But you must not doubt, Mr. Bass had said. You must never doubt. At the gate, Mr. Bass stood beaming and waving as they went off down the street with their spaceship between them. But then all at once he gave a loud, anxious cluck and darted out of his gate after them. Boys! Boys! Goodness gracious! he cried, coming up all out of breath. I almost forgot! Disastrous! You are to remember to take a mascot. This is most important. A mascot. Will you remember? Amazed, the boys promised. But as they looked back after little Mr. Bass scuttling along with his gray gardening coat flapping about his knees and the few hairs on his bald head lifting in the breeze, they wondered just why it should be so terribly important that they take a mascot.